Our scripture tonight comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 and 30, and as a supporting verse, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Ye will surely say to me the pro this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving, saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong but he passing through the midst of them went his way and Jesus was quoting the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of my message tonight is, What Were We Thinking? <laughs> And the one idea that I'm trying to get across is this, is that Jesus Christ claimed to be the Messiah. And in his day, that claim was rejected, just as it is today, and for many of the same reasons. So let's take a look at our scripture, beginning with Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. Let's go to our scripture. And the first thing we see is that Jesus returns to his hometown in Nazareth, and it's a Saturday, it's the Sabbath day, that is the day of the Hebrew worship. And he entered the synagogue, as it says, as was his custom. And every, every Sabbath day, where did you find Jesus? He was in church, he was in, he was in the synagogue in his place. Now he was the creator of the universe, he was God incarnate, and he found that it's important to be in worship every week. How much more so should we find ourselves in worship every week? Now, are we worshiping on the Sabbath now? Actually, yes. Yes, we are. We most certainly are. It is the Sabbath right now, and it has been since sundown. <laughs> so we're covered. <laughs> All right. Uh, so... Uh, so here we are, and I want to commend all of you, and I know it's a little risk coming tonight, but I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, and if Jesus saw it as being so important to worship once a week, well, we need to do that as well. Now, in the 
synagogues of Jesus' time, they didn't have assigned pastors like we do today. I know the scripture says minister, but that's a, an anachronism. They had uh, leaders of the synagogue. They may or may not have had a rabbi. They probably didn't, not in Nazareth, a little town. And what they would do is that the leaders of the synagogue would just ask somebody to read and to give a devotional every, every Sabbath day. And if someone was visiting, and if you had a traveling rabbi, like Jesus was considered, a traveling teacher of the scripture, well, he was almost assured to be asked. And because Jesus had already performed some miracles and word about him had spread, uh, when he showed up to his hometown of uh, Nazareth, he grew up there, uh, he was certainly asked to read from the scripture, and that's exactly what he did. And then the next thing we see is that he read from the book of Isaiah, and he read those words, he quoted, and we've read those tonight, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, but not all of 2. He stopped where it talks about the day of vengeance. He didn't get that far. He covered the part that where his messianic mission was to start and to continue until his return. And it stopped. He stopped reading when it came to the part where it talks about God's judgment, because that's at the end of this age. And he stopped right there. So he talks about certain things. And you can see that. We're going to take a look at verse 17 through 19. Let's take go back to 17. And he said, and when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written. And let's go to 18. And he begins to read. And the first thing we see here is that he stood when he read. He had reverence for the Word of God. We don't see a lot of that today, do we? We don't see uh, a lot of reverence for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, my father was uh, attended a Messianic Jewish congregation. And at the beginning of each of their Shabbat services, the rabbi would carry a scroll, a big scroll of the scripture. And in this scroll, it was, it was the Old and New Testament. And they would carry that scroll around the outside and through, and people would just come up and they'd put their hand up to show reverence, not worshiping the Bible, but show reverence for the Word of God. And then they would place the scripture on a special place in front of the congregation. And it was just an honor that they gave and a respect that they offered to the Word of God. And we need to be careful about handling how we respect the Bible. And we need to have that. And he stood as he read out of respect for the Scripture there. And it says that he stood for the reading of the Word and also that he was anointed. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And the Spirit of God was upon him. We remember it. Jesus' baptism just before this event, what happened? The clouds opened up, a voice came out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit came down on Jesus like a, in the form of a, a dove, or it looked like a dove. And when you hear the preaching of the Word of God, it is important and to have Holy Ghost filled preaching, amen? Amen. amen. And to have Spirit led preaching. And I trust every week, I pray and I ask God, Lord, help me to say what you want me to say every week. And I trust him that I do that. And, uh, if it, and how do I know if he does it? Well, if it touches your heart, then, I, <laughs> then if the Lord uses what I'm saying to bless your life, then and a message to you and keeps you encouraged, then we know that it's effective. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And when a pastor preaches the word of God faithfully, he can't lose, can he not? He just can't lose. So we say that he was doing that, that he was filled with the Spirit, and every pastor needs to be filled with the Spirit, called by him. Also, the message was to preach the gospel. Now that word gospel means what? Good news. It's the good news that God has become a person, and that person has showed us what we need to do to be right with him. We need to depend on him. We need to turn from our sin and ask Jesus to apply his sacrifice to our lives. And when we do that, when we do that, Jesus will come into your life and he will make you the kind of person he makes you his at that moment. So we need to preach the gospel. And he is to preach to the poor. It says here, he is to preach to the poor. Not just to the people that don't have material things, but to the spiritually poor. And that includes everybody. Does anybody have enough 
of what it takes to make themselves righteous before a holy God? No. Nobody. We're all poor, aren't we? None of us measure up. None of us have enough credit with God <laughs> to earn our own salvation. We're poor. We need that. We need what Jesus has to offer. He was to preach deliver to the, deliverance to the captives. Now the word captive here in the Greek is I kamalatos. I say that again. I kamalatois, rather. That's the Greek word, and it actually means a prisoner of war. He is to preach to the captives, a prisoner of war. Now, are we prisoners? Are lost people prisoners? Are they prisoners? What war are they prisoners of? Sin. Sin. And who do they belong to? Satan. They're his. They're his from the beginning. And they're held captive by their sin. And Jesus has come to set the captive what? Free. Free. And that's what he has done. So Jesus is claiming to do all these things, that he is the one, he's the fulfillment of these promises. So he is also to preach to the brokenhearted. Do we have brokenhearted people in our world today? Crushed by grief, shattered, opposed, cut off, blemished by sins, violated by sin, victimized, infected, diseased, weakened, subdued, injured, and bankrupt. <laughs> Brokenhearted. He come to mend the brokenhearted. And we can trust Him and He can be our comfort and He can give you peace when nothing else will do. He is to give sight to the blind. Not only to those who are physically blind, but spiritually blind. Did Jesus heal the blind man? Did He, re did he give sight to those who were physically blind? Yes, He did. It was a miracle to prove who He was. But does He open the eyes of the spiritually blind? He opened my eyes. I was 14 years old when I gave my life to Christ. A man who I talked to last night, he had his 94th? third, 93 or 94th. 93rd or 94th birthday yesterday. I said, what would you do for your birthday? And he says, I drove down to the store and bought a gallon of milk. <laughs> that was his day. But he was the man that led me and my dad to the Lord. June 14, 1972. At about 6.15. And I asked Jesus, and he explained to me the good news of Jesus Christ, and it just made sense. The Holy Spirit just opened my eyes and said, what a neat idea. God became a person. And that person died on the cross to atone for my sin, to make me right with God. I want some of that. I said, Eddie, what do I need to do? He says, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. You need to ask Him to apply His sacrifice to your life. And I did. In that very moment, He did. And He changed my life. And he'll change your life too. And boy, if there was ever a blind young man, it was me. It was me. I didn't know up from down. Didn't know my left hand from my right hand. Didn't have a clue where I was going or even who I was. But that night, Jesus saved me. And he opened doors from that day right on to this one. And I'll never forget the goodness that he's given to me. And then he would set at liberty those who are bruised. There are people in our world who are physically, mentally, emotionally, and psychologically wounded. They're spiritually bruised. They've been offended. They've been hurt. They've been mistreated. Listen, you can get mad. I, t I used to teach ninth grade boys in Sunday school. And some of those boys wanted to be there, and other boys couldn't stand being there. And the only reason they were there because their parents made them come to Sunday school. They didn't like it. And I say to those young men that didn't want to be there, I said, listen, if you don't want to be here, that's I understand that. If you want to be mad at your parents for making you come, you be mad at your parents for making you come. If you want to be mad at me because I'm teaching you God's Word, go ahead and be mad at me because I'm teaching God's Word. But one person I don't want you to be mad at, and that's your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He hasn't done a thing but love you. He hasn't done a thing for you to be offended at Him about. But yet here we have people that are offended at Jesus. Why? Because he's telling them the truth about who he is. And he really loves them. But they're not loving him back. And finally, he was to preach the age of salvation. The acceptable year of the Lord. That's the dispensation that we're living in right now. The age of grace. 
the spiritual age. And then he folded up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant of the synagogue and he sat, sat down and he began to teach and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And he was making a claim when he said that. Now up until this point, Everybody was so proud of Jesus. They say he's, you know, he's one of ours. Isn't that great? Preacher boy from, our, from Nazareth. Look at that. He's, we've, we've heard he's done some great sermons and great things. And other people, we're so proud to have him. But then he said these words. This day has this been fulfilled in your ears. And, what he, and this was a prophecy out of Isaiah about the Messiah. They knew that that was a messianic prophecy, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. They knew that much. Any good Hebrew would know. They'd heard it over and over, that that's what the Messiah was going to come to do and be. And Jesus was saying that He was the one on whom the Spirit abode. That He was the one who was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, to the captives. That he was the one that was going to heal the brokenhearted. That he was the one who gave sight to the blind. And he had already given sight to the blind. He had already done that miracle. He had already healed lepers. He had already done that. And that he was the one who freed the, bu the bruised. And he was the one who was going to preach the acceptable age of the Lord. In many other places was Jesus making a claim of being the Messiah. Like in Matthew 16, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And when the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees were demanding the answer of Jesus at his trial, Are you the Christ? He held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say to you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And they rent their clothes. And then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. And when this claim dawned on them, their attitude toward Jesus became, began to change. At first, when he first started talking, they were impressed with his eloquence. <laughs> Boy, this, he's a good teacher. A lot of people today believe that. They believe Jesus is a great moral teacher, a great philosopher. And he was charming. He had winning words. He, when he spoke, people liked to gather around him. He had what we call charisma. That was the spirit that they were drawn to. But then they began to question and it was a subtle reaction. Have you ever been somewhere and listened to somebody talk and they're, maybe you've done that with me a couple of times. Did he just say what I thought he said? Did he just, did he just say what I heard, thought I heard he said? Did he say that? Did he say he was the one? Did he say that he was fulfilling this part? That he is the fulfillment of it? What? Did he say that? And that was the reaction. It was kind of growing. It kind of went through that building where he was. And then they say, wait a minute. Now, none of this is verbal. This is what the people are thinking. Don't, don't get me wrong here. None, nothing was actually said in the Scripture that these people are saying. But Jesus knew what they were thinking because Jesus knows what's in your heart. He knows what you're thinking. And, here's what, and it says here, and to questions begin to arise in their thoughts. Is, not, is this not Joseph's son? And Matthew's account of this is even more descriptive. It says, is not his mother and his brethren and his sisters, are they not all here with us, it says in Matthew? And then in Matthew 
13.57, it says, And they were offended at him. And that word offended means to trip over, <laughs> to stumble over. They stumbled over what he was claiming, that he was the Son of God, the Messiah. And then the next step, once they questioned, they demanded proof. They wanted him to prove who he was. If you're the, just much like the satanic temptation, if you're the Son of God, make these stones turn to bread. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself off this cliff and the angels will take, will take care of you. And they said, if you're the Son of God, we want you to see, I will want you to see healing. We want you to do a miracle just like you did in Capernaum. And they wanted him to prove himself. They were put into the sense. And you have to remember that all of this was thoughts in their minds. They're, they're still sitting there listening to him, maybe smiling at him and looking, but he knows their thought. They, he knows at that moment they have already rejected him. And how many Christians do we see in pews today? They look at the preacher and they're smiling, but Jesus knows, he knows that they have already been rejected. He's, his spirit, his calling has already been rejected. How sad to be that close and to be in that situation and have that moment replayed on Judgment Day. And a person sees that moment replayed on Judgment Day where they had a perfect opportunity to, uh, opportunity to repent of their sins and trust Christ. And they say in their minds, I'm not having any of this. What do you think they're going to say when they see that scene? They're going to say, what was I thinking? What? What was I thinking? That close to eternity. And I said, no. No. You can't. Who can afford that? What were they thinking? Jesus said in John 4, 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. 1 Corinthians, Paul says, For the Jew requires signs, and the Greek seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew a stumbling block, and unto the Greek foolishness. Sounds just like today, does it not? Sounds just like today. And then he said, No prophet is accepted in their own country. No prophet. They had rejected Christ and Jesus knew it. They didn't have to say a word. He knew it. And he knows it. He knows whether or not we really trust him and love him or not. He knows whether or not we see him as the Lord of our life or not. Because he grew up with them and they just could not accept, they allowed familiarity to breed contempt. They thought how far-fetched that his claims were that a hometown boy and the Messiah coming from Nazareth, no good things come from Nazareth, they say. Maybe there was even some envy and some jealousy amongst neighbors. But note the words here on the screen, in his own country. Jesus knew that he would be rejected in Nazareth and he knew that he would be rejected by the leadership of Israel. He knows, but you know he went to that cross anyway. Because well, even though his own received him not, received him not, he knew that we would. And it was for you and me that he died. And then he gives an example to drive home. Well, there were many, many widows in Israel. And Elijah was sent to one who wasn't Jewish. There were many lepers in Israel, but Elisha was sent to Naaman, a hated Syrian, a Gentile. Why? Them and not his own. Because his own were, was not worshiping God. Their hearts were not open to God. And when the people heard this, they became enraged. And they were hateful. And it was an insult, but it was a just deserved insult because he knew their hearts. He knew that if his own rejected him, that he would go to the Gentiles, and that's exactly what's happened. Salvation requires more than just saying that I'm a chosen race, or I'm a chosen people, or I'm an American, or I'm this color or that color, 
or my grandmother was a Catholic, or my grandfather was Methodist, or whatever. It's more than that. We have to have our own repentance. We have to have our own trust in the Savior and trust Him. Jesus said, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. In John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And then the people rose up. They show their true colors, their, their hearts. They can't hold in the facade any longer. They can't be civil anymore. They take matters into their own hands, and they thrust him out. And they're going to take him to the wall of the city and throw him off and kill him. Right then and there. But it wasn't his time to die. They suffered from insane wrath. Insanity that's due to a closed mind. Whoever Jesus is, he can't be the Messiah. He just can't. Whoever Jesus is, he can't be God's son. Whatever accounts for that empty tomb, it can't be a resurrection. Whatever accounts for his miracles, they can't be what they say they are. Close binding. Their violent attempt to silence Jesus, their insane behavior, a colossal failure. They violated everything that they knew to be right. They violated their own rules, trying to commit assault and a, and a capital murder without a fair trial. In Genesis, the Lord said, and the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence and our steadfastness to the end. So we need to check ourselves, do we not? Do we believe? Do you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is who He said He was? Is He your Savior tonight? If not, I would beg you, before it's too late, you don't want to be in a situation where you're this close, this close, to knowing Christ is your Savior. But then finding yourself someday, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next year, it could be 50 years from now, when you're standing before your Savior to give your account, what have you done with Christ? And this moment is replayed. And you've rejected Christ. Now there's no hope. You're going to spend an eternity separated from Him in a place that was never intended for your soul. And you'll see how close you came. And you'll say, what was I thinking? What was I thinking to pass that opportunity? You're never too old. You're never too young to make Christ your Savior and decide to live for Him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank You so much for tonight in Your Word. Help us to be better than the Nazarenes who thought they knew Jesus so well that they could reject Him. Oh, I grew up with that stuff. I don't need it. And they fail to see that who you really are, that our souls are in your hands, and our souls are accountable to you. And Father, we pray that you would have mercy on our souls, and that you would forgive us of our sins. And Father, we know that you love us, and you would not have any of us to perish, but you want us to be your children. Help us, Lord, to be always mindful of who you are, you're a good, good father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.